So I'd like to introduce Dr. Sarah A. Lacey. She's a biological anthropologist here at California State University, Dominguez Hills. Uh, she teaches biological anthropology, human variation, human osteology, and forensic anthropology. If you want to interject at any point, feel free. You can just be like, wait, 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 I want to explain. Yeah. Um, her doctoral work focused on oral pathology in Neanderthals and early modern humans in the late Pleistocene in Europe and Southwest Asia. Her research overlaps with paleoanthropology, paleopathology, dental anthropology, late Pleistocene archaeology, human environment interaction, and origins of health disparities. And you're currently developing a collaboration with Durham University in the UK, and where you're exploring health, diet, and environmental change in the European late Upper Paleolithic and early Mesolithic with a focus on oral health, including isotopic, biomolecular, and phytolith research. Yes, except that last one is kind of in a weird standstill, but we could yeah. develop that at some point. <laughs> <laughs> And you also have an Instagram account at Hot Hominin, mm -hmm. and uh, a website too where you can find out more, sarahlaceyphd.com. Cool. Yeah. Quite a handful. Yeah. <laughs> so is there any like introduction to like yourself or like how do you usually even say what you do? Like how do you define it? I mean, if I'm talking to like a non-academic audience, I usually just say that I'm like a prehistoric dentist because mm -hmm. I think that usually gets it across to people. Um, I'm not doing obviously like dental work on anybody. Uh, I can really get at diagnosing even living people. I can look in your mouth and tell you what's wrong, <laughs> but I can't do anything about it uh, because what I'm interested in is like reconstructing overall health, right? Yeah, right. The oral cavity is a good microcosm for systemic health overall, right? How your mouth is doing is, reflects how your whole body is. Right. So it's a good way for research, you know, because I have um, good preservation of teeth. They preserve really well in the fossil record, so I can have the largest sample sizes, and they really reflect what's going on in the, the whole body. Yeah, cool. It is. Yeah. So. No, I mean, I, I, I wanted just to get a more just general background, like, where did you come from? What was your environment like? Um, and also just get into your undergrad experience and how you developed an interest in just anthropology in general. Well, I grew up in a number of places, like Canada, um, Texas. Uh, so I was used to moving around a lot, and I was always really fascinated with other people. Like, since I was four years old, I knew I wanted to be an archaeologist. Mm. Uh, my mom has, like, art of mine from elementary school where I, like, have Egyptology, like, you know, just atrociously spelled, but, <laughs> like, you know, describing that that's, like, what I wanted to be. So I've kind of always known that. Um, when I went to undergrad, I wanted to do anthropology. My parents didn't think I could get a job, so they were really mm. pushing me to something uh. else. And so economics seemed like a good fit for me because I had a lot of interest in kind of like a Marxist perspective. Yeah. Uh, but I was secretly doing anthropology on the side. And then towards the end of my undergrad career, my parents were like, my mother took a new job where she was actually hiring archaeologists. And I was oh, like, oh, yeah. I guess I shouldn't have been so hard on that. And I was like, yeah. oh, I've been secretly doing it the whole time. Yeah. Right. So, oh, that's so, funny. so I was able to do that. Um, and I basically had it also a minor, a major in economics, but I didn't fulfill the very last class because I was already there. Right. right? Yeah. So I like much more than a minor, and I was also minoring in German. So then when I finished that, I was interested in graduate school. I graduated in 2008, which was like, you know, economically not a great year to be getting out with an right. undergrad That's degree. True. Yeah, it was just hitting. Yeah. So there was like no job. So I was like, all right, well, grad school, all right, it's going to be a good fit. Uh, and my undergrad advisor in anthropology really wanted me to go to his PhD advisor. He felt like, um, you know, you always have this now, now that I'm faculty and I'm in the same position, if you have certain students that you really like connect with and you want to like guide them on similar passage right. your own. So he made a lot of phone calls on my behalf and got me into a grad program and uh, where I was fully funded and went from there. Wow. Yeah. And um, I mean, I'm sh yeah, it helps to know like from an early age what you want to do and it really seemed like you did stick with it. But um, I mean, I, I've always, I always try to ask people like, what, what challenges did you come across in, you know, your academic journey, if any? Well, certainly like, I'm in paleoanthropology, which is one of the few subfields that still is like white male dominated. Right. And certainly going to like conferences and things, that was kind of intimidating because it was a whole lot of like twitchy white mustaches and like, <laughs> you're basically like, why I expected to see pith helmets on these people. So I already kind of did a fit in that way. And when I think about like kind of fitting 
I mean, I know that I had like the privilege of, of being a white woman, but certainly there were a number of times as, as a woman where I had issues in undergrad that steered me away from certain things. Like with economics, I remember being in a labor economics class and I was the only woman in the class and we get our midterms back and I have a 93 and everyone else failed. Uh, and hmm. so <laughs> towards the end of the semester, I'm still the only person passing the class without the curve. And the faculty hmm. member starts yelling at the class. He's like, if any of you can explain to me why Sarah, who's going to make 72 cents on every one of your dollar, huh. has an incentive to do well in this course, I'll pass you. And the whole class was dead silent. And they couldn't tell him why I would have an incentive to work hard. And so, and so after class, he was like, so please tell me you're getting your PhD in economics. And I was like, no, I, just, mm-hmm. I have no interest in this. Like, irony. Yeah. yeah, I was like, I'm going to go do anthropology. Right. <laughs> uh, so there's certainly like things that kind of steered me. Um, but also the field I went into was made quite easy for me, that I had advisors that were really big advocates of mine, that really went to bat for me, nominated me for awards, helped me get into projects. And so... You know, I didn't have to fight that hard for this particular one because I had such good mentors. Right, which I think is one of the bigger challenges for, I think any of us, like undergrads, graduate students, like finding a mentor who can, yeah. you know, steer you in the right way, encourage you to keep going, advise you in any way uh, possible. So that's awesome, yeah. definitely. Have you kept in contact with them even till now? Yeah, actually yeah. my undergrad advisor, he wrote me letters of recommendation for when I went, be, went on the job market as a professor. Uh, and I saw him at a conference the year before last, and it was definitely kind of, you know, he was like a little misty-eyed almost, <laughs> just like, oh, wow, like, now you're my colleague. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, and so I certainly want to do that for my own students because it, you know, I, there's no way I would have gotten into grad school if it wasn't for him because I didn't really understand exactly what that meant, you know? When you're like a really good yeah. undergrad, you understand that experience. And that's being a good undergrad is not being a good graduate student. Oh, no. You know, that's, mm-hmm. uh, being a good graduate student is so much more self-directed, and I was used to like, you know, being like the little kind of brown noser, good undergrad who did all their work, but I didn't know how to make that leap to like it being self-directed, and I needed right. somebody to like sh- model that for me. Right. And uh, what um, what graduate school did you go to? Washington University. Washington. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, in your interaction with students, have you like? What's an example of how you've kind of done that for them, kind of the mentoring that happened for you? Like, do you see yourself, like, how do you see yourself fulfilling that role now that you're, you know, in this completely, you know, now you're the professor, now you're the advisor? Uh, well, I actually just took a student to a conference with me back in April, yeah. and she's looking to apply for grad school for this coming year. So one of the things that we were doing was making sure, like, I introduced her to a people mm-hmm. who are potential graduate student mentors. Uh, we sat down and talked with the reps for Wenner Gren and NSF because she was she'll need grant money to be mm-hmm. able to afford to do this. So that way, when they see her name, you know, they'll remember her. Yeah. And then we also talked to the head of the. I'm in the American Association of Physical Anthropologists. Uh, They have this program called IDEAS, which is to mentor undergrads and early graduate students of non-represented backgrounds in biological anthropology. So making sure we made a connection with her and that group so that she could be mentored to help her into graduate school um, as a Latina woman because they're not particularly well represented in biological Mm -hmm. anthropology. Right, right, right. And uh, I mean, in looking back, throughout your whole academic career, is there anything you would do differently? (laughs) It's kind of hard to say, right? Uh, I feel incredibly lucky. Like, I got a tenure-track professorship straight out of graduate school. I I got the first grant I applied for. I finished my master's and PhD in five and a half years. Yeah. So there's not a whole lot that I would, like, necessarily do differently. Um, I do wish that I had a longer postdoc. I had started a, like a little baby postdoc at Durham University where I basically had talked them into funding me for a semester for me to write grants to be able to stay. But then I got a professorship, so I didn't get to continue that. And if had I been able to, I think I would have had that project more solidified before I dove into all the bureaucracy and, of being a tenure track faculty member. Right. Um, also at a university where like I don't think I fit in super well. You know, you're, they're so desperate. There's so few jobs. So I took the first one that came, and I didn't negotiate for salary very well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously I'm not there anymore. I'm now here, which right. I think is a lot better fit for my interests. But there's so few jobs, and you're not really getting, like, you can't, you don't feel like you're in a position to negotiate. 
right? You're, right? You feel really desperate. And looking back, like, I was a stronger candidate than I acknowledged, but, you know, I didn't want to be unemployed. Right, right, right. And, um, I mean, you did say, well, I wanted to ask what, what brought you here, specifically to Dominguez Hills or to the L.A. area. So I was on the job market last year, and there were like 12 jobs in the world I could apply for that were a good fit for me. And I interviewed for here and then for one at uh, Lyon University in the Netherlands. And when I interviewed here, the things that really jumped out at me were that this campus was number eight in the nation for getting students from the bottom two income quintiles into the top income quintile, which is really something I'm incredibly passionate about is like using even though the university is a system of imperialism and racism and sexism, (laughs) to use this as a tool to like really enrich the lives of of students and and get them into a better place, right? That they're going to take on all this debt, especially. Right. Right. So this seemed like a campus that really prioritized that. And when I talked to the department here, it was just everything that they were doing was focused around that idea. Mm. And that, that just got me really excited. And then also in my personal life, like my family had all ended up here on the West Coast. And so moving over here certainly was... Yeah, fortuitous, you know, it's not something yeah. I had a lot of control over, but right. it was nice. Cool, yeah. cool. I definitely, like, because Dominguez Hills has an interesting demographic, right, where it's largely, like, Latino and, yeah. and like, the student body is quite different from, like, the other Cal States or even universities <clears throat> around here. Mm-hmm. So how do you think, like, you've been able to fit into that, considering, I guess, how different university life can be on other campuses? Well, I was at a university before that was bordering Ferguson, Missouri, and I started teaching there two weeks after Michael Brown was murdered. Oh. Mm-hmm. And I'm teaching classes on race, basically. Mm-hmm. And so I couldn't just you know, be teaching that on one hand and have my students going home through protests at night where mm-hmm. the police are tear gassing people and pretend that like that isn't happening. Right. So I got very involved in protest movement in St. Louis, and that became, I was spending so much time on it in my personal life, I was like, I what? I should be using this to help me get tenure. I should be like merging this into my academic life as well, which is why I have like one of the paper on in transforming anthropology, which is the journal for black anthropologists about how um, two universities in the area were using Ferguson mm. or not using Ferguson for their, their own gains. Wow. Um, and so when I was interviewing here, I was very outspoken about that. You know, I wanted to, because I'd kind of gotten in trouble at my old university for for my activism. And so I was really very honest here that these were the things that I was interested in. Um, racial justice issues were going to be extremely important to me, and I was going to be vocal about them. And that made them like me here, as opposed to seeming me as a liability. Right, right, right. And I, I do want to talk more about the, you know, the Ferguson. I know you, you've you been active, or you were active out there. and But um, I did... I had a question about graduate school because I know, I know for me personally, it was hard to even just find out what graduate school was about, where to go, you know, what resources I had, who to talk to. So if you could give any advice to students that are looking to do graduate school, you know, what advice could you give them? Yeah, you're, you're, it's not like undergrad and we are applying to like a university, right? Students think, oh, well, this place is the most prestigious. Right. No, it's, you're applying to a person, not a program. So look, find people who are doing research that intersects with what you're interested in and then see where, what program they're in, right? Email them directly, say, and, and you're not just trying to convince them to accept you. You're trying to con- sell, they, you want them to try to sell themselves to you as well. So you email them and say, like, this is what I have to offer, but what do you have to offer me? Right. Right? Mm-hmm. Because you're not groveling for their scraps, right? You're going to be doing research that helps their research profile as well. So yeah. email them and say, what do, you, what do you have for me? Are you taking graduate students? Well, what kind of funding do you offer graduate students? Where have your graduate students ended up? Have they gotten jobs? The kind of questions that you should be asking, but I think a lot of students are afraid to. They feel like they're not in a position of power to do that. Um, but also finding a faculty member whose field is close enough to what you're interested in who can kind of vet the list that you're putting together and say, like, oh, yeah, that is a good program, or, yeah, I know somebody there. I'll make a phone call. Right. Uh, because so much of it is about personal connections, right? It, you can look really great on paper, but if they've never seen your name before, when it comes down to, like, sitting down with a pile of mm-hmm. graduate applications, you're, you don't have a very good chance. It's the students who, oh, yeah, I remember getting an email from them. Oh, yeah, I've met that person before. Oh, yeah, I've gotten a phone call about them. That's going to get you through that first round. And Yeah. No, and it seems like a better approach because I, I feel like in asking what you can get from it, I think it's a whole different approach than just like, oh, what, what can I get? Like, what is out there? Like, 
it, like you said, getting, getting the, the scraps almost pretty yeah. much. So it, it's def definitely a different approach. I think a much better useful approach yeah. for us. Yeah. The mm -hmm. students, like, I guess, kind of going back to like the power dynamic, right? They feel like they can't. And yeah. if, even if they do ask, like, what do you guys have? It's, it's, even that's almost like, well, trying to brown those a little bit maybe, you know? So it's, it definitely is important to come at it, I see, from like that different angle. You know? Right. Well, especially because you're about to spend minimum six <laughs> years, you know, mm -hmm. in this program, delaying making an income, right? Doing research is basically yeah. in the name of somebody else. Um, and so they should be offering something to you. I mean, I also tell students, you know, if you have a bunch of undergrad student loan debt, grad school might, might not be a good decision, mm -hmm. right? Because you're putting mm -hmm. off so long. Uh, if you are not gonna, if you don't get into a really high ranked program, it might not be worth it. Because right. a paper just came out in archeology span showing that, you know, more than half of the professorship positions were, that were hired were only from like the top 20 universities. Everyone else was not getting hired. So if you're not getting into those programs, even if you are funded, it, you're probably not going to have a job at the end. And the job that you get at the end is not typically making that much more money than you would have made with your undergrad degree. Mm -hmm. right. So it has to be something that like you can't imagine yourself doing anything else. You don't have a lot of debt. It's a top-ranked program, and you're fully funded. Wow. You're not taking out more debt yeah. to get it. Um, which I know seems like a lot of things to meet, and certainly considering like all the things that are stacked against students with getting into graduate school and all the, you know, how like that just that system of admissions to graduate school perpetuates inequality. Mm -hmm. I also want to be I want to fight that system, but I also want to be realistic to my individual students and not just like throw them into that like swim upstream and fight the system on your own yeah. um, and have them get out at the end with like you know a lot of debt and not a lot of job prospects. Right. Wow. Well. Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't want to be too much of a downer, sorry. No, it's, no, it's, it's realistic, <laughs> I think. And it is. Yeah. Different approach as well. Yeah, because I feel like there's not that much information out there. No. Because um, I know, like, there's students I've spoken with, and whenever I tell them, like, no, you want to, like, contact these people, they're, a lot of people don't do that. And then when they don't get any, like, acceptances, it's like, what could I do better? And it's, yeah, you have to make those personal connections. It's something a lot of people don't consider, right? I think. Or students just think like it's just all about just getting good grades or good right. test scores, or yeah. But it really is the building the connections and reaching out to professors, finding out what type of programs you're interested in, what research you're interested in. So definitely, yeah. they have to like you as a person too. I mean, right. my PhD yeah. advisor was actually quite explicit that he vetted students based off of will they get along with my other students because well, we have like my PhD advisors had 16 students ever and we're very much like a family right. and he's had students come in who are like you know gonna be great researchers someday but they have an abrasive personality or something like right. that and he's like it's just not gonna be a good fit yeah. because you you know you're in a lab together all the time you right. get and that's along. important for sure yeah. I feel like my my lab <laughs> it was just like I feel like my my mentor and my professor there didn't care about that about our, our relationship, our, our personalities, mm -hmm. how we're going to click with each other. It was just kind of like, yeah, you're just, interested, do, you're just in. do your thing, yeah. yeah. Be independent, try to get along with people. But I don't think that really worked well, right? So that is important, yeah, yeah. definitely. I can definitely see that. Yeah. <laughs> so how about, um, I guess, what advice would you give anyone trying to uh, pursue that doctorate? Like, is there anything else that you think that they should know before or while in it? I mean, like as I said before, like you can't imagine yourself doing anything else because mm -hmm. <laughs> it's certainly not your, you're not doing it for the money. <laughs> you're going to be working way more than 40 hours a week. Uh. But if you're really passionate about it, it doesn't feel like work, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, though I don't want to get into the whole capitalist uh, <laughs> the way that we get like unpaid labor out of people. Uh, yeah. Our other things I would tell people, I think we kind of covered the stuff that's really the advice I ended up giving out a yeah. lot. Um, yeah, and go someplace that you're going to want to live. That's another thing. I was actually talking to someone the other day, and she was, oh, I've got, I'm waiting to hear back from a program in Indiana. And I was like, you've lived in Long Beach your whole life. Like, do you think you're going to be happy in Indiana for six years? And she's like, I didn't really think about it. And I was like, well, I was in Missouri for nine years, and I made the best of it. But it was also not like a place that I saw myself spending nine years. Right. Mm. Definitely. That's important. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, so... Kind of going to your personal research. Uh, so you do like a lot of dental work or 
you know, dental research, right? Because you say that it's, you know, kind of an overall, you can find out what the health of individuals are like. Um, and in one of your articles, you're talking about the, the broken hill, or BH1. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could elaborate on what makes that specific specimen so interesting to focus on. Uh, so broken, and that's a, a complicated thing with the name, right? Because broken hill is kind of like the British colonial name, and Kabwe mm -hmm. is the, the native Zambian name for the same location. So people are now pushing towards calling it Kabwe. Yeah. So away from, the, and there's a whole history with the specimen because it's still housed in London. Because <laughs> yeah. the British say like, oh, we don't trust you in Zambia to take care mm -hmm. of your own cultural heritage, even though I went and saw it in London and it's just sitting in like a <laughs> cabinet in a museum. It's not like right. it's some sort of special climate controlled box or something, you know. Yeah. Uh, but the specimen is really interesting because it, we don't have a good date for it. It's somewhere over 130,000 years old. It's from a lead mine, so we have trouble getting any good dates, but it's probably about half a million years old. But it has extensive cavities. like. Half of the teeth in the mouth have a cavity, cavity, carious lesion in them. And some of them are like halfway eaten away. Mm. Really big caries. And we never see that in the Paleolithic. We do see, I mean, I've, I've looked at plenty of Paleolithic um, carious lesions. And by the way, caries is like the disease state of having cavities. Make that clear. Yeah. Um, you, know, you might see like one, right? And it's like mm -hmm. a small one, a small occlusal one. This mouth is just riddled with terrible oral health. And so thinking about like what could have caused that is fascinating to me. I mean, the, the, the uh, hypothesis has been put forth that because it was in a lead mine, it was probably living in that area, it's probably high lead content in the right. water. If you have a lot of lead um, poisoning, uh, the bacteria, the acid they're producing in your mouth mixes with that lead and produces like sulfuric acid and all sorts of things. And yeah. so potentially that's what was eating the teeth away. Right. Uh, but it's, it's certainly an unusual specimen, even by today's standards. I mean, you'd have to be eating so much candy, <laughs> which is actually kind of funny because the last paper, I think you had mentioned before, like, well, what, why did you redo a paper on the detailing the oral health when there was one done in the 70s? Well, the one done in the 70s was actually funded by Mars Corporation. Huh. It's in like the candy bar company. Oh, wow. Oh. And I'm sure from their perspective, it's like, <laughs> look, prove, like it's not us causing cavities. These things have been around for half a million right. years. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. Maybe I should be going to them for funding. <laughs> Those special interests. Yeah, exactly. Of. You have to watch out for that. You got to look yeah. at where yeah. did that funding come from. It's like those things where like where the Coca Cola companies like funding certain research on health mm -hmm. and obesity. Yeah. So it's yeah. yeah. They're like, oh, it's fat, not sugar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> eat. Don't eat meat. Don't eat. Things. Yeah. yeah. Same thing with the cigarette companies. Yeah. Yep. Um, so what were like the different methods that you use versus like the other research on that specimen? Uh, that specimen, well, there, when it was done, there wasn't like a standardized protocol for scoring cavities. That was published in 91. Mm -hmm. So going through and actually giving breakdowns that this is like a level 8 or whatever for each cavity. Mm -hmm. um, also, the periodontal disease condition hadn't been described previously. Yeah. And so I don't think we should be looking at those things separately, right? The, how the condition of the uh, alveolar bone and the gingiva mm -hmm. should be relevant as well. So documenting that so that they have a, a full document, you know, it's more just like a case study. It was a small paper, yeah. but just really giving a full detail of what that individual is like. So in the future, people don't have to necessarily go visit the original specimen. Yeah. Because the casts aren't super great. Right. No, but definitely the paper, like, it wasn't very long, but it was really detailed. Like, each, like, cavity was was talked about and described in details. Basically, like, three pages worth of, like, I don't know what you're saying, but it, <laughs> it's really interesting. <laughs> Because I got the gist, like, okay, this one, this two. But still, like, it was really, I think, well written and well done. Just yeah. very thorough, I think. Yeah. Thanks. So, Thank you. Yeah. And so um, what do you think uh, your findings, how are they, uh, like, what are the implications of it and what makes it, I guess, important for studies on oral health or in this period in particular? I think for a long time we had this assumption that people had really great oral health in the Paleolithic because they had straight mm -hmm. teeth. If you look at like casts of like Neanderthals and Homo erectus, you just always have like these really straight teeth. They have this um, like occlusal bite because they wear the teeth down so they neat like this. Mm -hmm. right? And so their teeth look really straight and we just kind of been like, oh yeah, teeth were great. And it wasn't until agriculture that oral health went down. But it had never been systematically documented and it was really surprising to me that no one had. It seemed kind of obvious. Uh, I had gone into graduate school already with the economics background and having these issue, you know, interesting questions about um, 
paleo demographics and reconstructing how, like you know what life was like for these individuals yeah. and so this seemed like such an obvious way to do it so surprised people hadn't and what i found was that yeah they have straight teeth but their periodontal condition is not good mm. lots of you know, just rampant rates of periodontal disease uh, a lot more cavities than had been previously documented mm-hmm. partially because paleoanthropologists aren't trained in paleopathology Typically, paleopathology has been the domain of bioarchaeologists who tend to work in more recent material, often in like medieval material or things that really in the last maybe 3,000 years. Right. And so their methods were not being applied in the Paleolithic. And so when I actually started looking for these things, all of a sudden they're just popping up everywhere. Oh, lots of huh. oral lesions and cavities and terrible periodontal disease. And so now we can say, oh, it's actually not just agriculture that caused poor oral health. This is, has a much deeper antiquity. And really, especially with cavities, what I saw was that cavities start to increase with the end of the last glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't just everything's great and then agriculture, but that there was actually a trajectory that started towards the end of the last glacial maximum of changing mm-hmm. diet. And that agriculture is really just kind of an inflection point of a trajectory that was already occurring, not just this huge sea change. Yeah. And that's backed up with work that people are doing in North Africa, um, like at the site of um, Torfolt, which is what Isabella de Groot is working there. Who else is working there? Uh, but they found tons of cavities, for yeah. instance, and that's at 14,000 years. People are um, grinding wild acorns, for instance. Right? And that's pre-agriculture, but yeah. they are doing very like systematic exploitation of a specific food product. And so oh, I think okay. what we're showing is that all those things are occurring before agriculture. It isn't just this, everything's the same, and then boom. Right. So what, what could we say is causing that or right. caused that. Yeah. Uh, part that of the portrayal. argument is that it's like population density, right? So the last glacial maximum is mm-hmm. you know, everyone's been squished down into these refugia in Europe. They're down in Spain and Italy. So tight population density. Um, people are seeing a lot more cultural differentiation at this point because people are all next to each other. So mm-hmm. it's like you want to look different than your neighbor. So <laughs> we see this big explosion in cave art and in personal adornments and things like that. So to do that, they're also having to more intensely exploit the food resources around them. So we're seeing now they're also eating turtles and hares and birds, things they weren't eating before, because mm-hmm. you could like kill a mammoth and everyone could eat for a <laughs> while. Before now it's like, oh no, we have to like go out and gather mussels. Right. And think about how many calories you get per each muscle, which how much work you have to get to get mm-hmm. that thing off right. and open. Right? They're putting much more work into getting a much smaller reward packet or like how many calories they're getting back out of it. And so I think because we're seeing them doing that, they're having less fat in their diet. Because if you eat a high protein diet, you need to have either fat or carbohydrates so that you don't get protein poisoning. Basically, like once you hit about 35% of your calories being protein, you'll start to have signs of protein poisoning. And if you're eating a bunch of rabbits and birds Mm -hmm. and stuff, they don't have much fat. Mm -hmm. And so to make sure that they're not getting protein poisoning, they're having to now eat a lot more carbohydrates, which is like going after berries. We start to see evidence that people are eating honey, all these sorts of things. And I think that's why we're seeing this kind of change in oral health. Uh, Because before, if you ate a mammoth, you don't have to worry about getting carbohydrates because there's so much fat mixed in with that protein. Wow. Especially now that like dietarily, like we're... It's all about the protein. Like, if you want to get muscle, like, you better be having all this protein. So, yeah. do you think, like, all that kind of contributes to, I don't know, like, because now we see rates of, you know, obesity are going up, especially here in the West. And, yeah, like, how, how do you think, you know, talking about <clears throat> the integration of carbs, how has that impacted our health? Well, it certainly wasn't good for our oral health. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it doesn't seem to be very good for our, our overall health, right? Uh, because a lot of people eat much less than 35% of their calories from protein. Right. Right? They're really getting the majority of them from carbohydrates. And if we look at like the food pyramid, I know the food pyramid has kind of been redefined in the last few years, but like when I think about my childhood, right, the base was like all carbs, right? It the was. real base was like wheat, and there was a whole separate section from dairy from meat, yeah. which of course, right, that's just like lobbyists from the food yeah. industry, because we think about right, only 30% of people on the planet can even digest lactose, right? Yeah. right? Except we're saying that, oh no, it has like its own <laughs> own building block on the pyramid, right? Yeah. Uh, and so now looking at that, it seems so preposterous if we think about a paleolithic diet, like why are fruits and vegetables, like the mm-hmm. bottom one, right? Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and that, it's just a reflection of lobbying. Yeah. 
But because of that, we grew up with that. We were taught that that's how to eat. And if you look at like the obesity rates, like since 1990, really, it's when mm-hmm. it's been like skyrocketing. Right. Right. Because in '90, you know, no state had more than 19 percent of the population obese, mm-hmm. and now no state has less than that. <laughs> right. And it's such a short period of time it for is. us to occur. Right. Um, from an epidemiological perspective, it's, it's incredibly rapid. Yeah. And mm-hmm. we don't seem to have very good responses to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also these fake sugars, too. Yeah. Uh, I had a C. difficile infection two years ago, and now this data is coming out that C. difficile is it feeds off of like a sugar substitute. Was it tetralose? That's like common in, sh- in like sugar free ice cream and things like that. Wait, what is this? C. Uh, C. difficile. It's a it more and more common intestinal infection. Oh. Uh, I had on antibiotics. For, I got sick in an airport oh. and I had like a persistent uh, sinus infection and I got this terrible intestinal infection. Oh. Uh, mm. And now I can't have gluten or dairy. <laughs> 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 so it was like interesting in the context of my own research, right. yeah. but I didn't really want to be my own guinea pig. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you've also done research on comparing humans and Neanderthals, mm-hmm. which, how do you pronounce Neanderthal? Is it Neanderthal or tall? Or oh, tall? see, at the very beginning you said tall, and I was like, look at you, you got it correct. Uh, Mr. Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people say Neanderthal. Okay. So, yeah. So this, this is, yeah, okay, I got, I got the answer for you, right? <laughs> so this comes from German, right? Neanderthal means Neander Valley. Tall is valley. Okay. And the Germans pronounced it tall. What the H was there, it was silent. And so when we named Neanderthalensis, right, the H was there, but it wasn't meant to be pronounced. Uh, and then the German language itself has gone through and kind of dropped a lot of letters that were unpronounced, including the H's from things like tall. So Germans pronounce it Neanderthal. Um, a lot of Americans pronounce it Neanderthal to reflect the proper German pronunciation with the re- expectation that if, the, if you write the H, the H is silent. A lot of this, me personally, I don't even write the H to make sure that people pronounce it correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, but you will still hear people occasionally say Neanderthal. Yeah. Uh, I was actually on a date once and someone corrected me and I was like, you, you, mean, you mean the <laughs> thing I have a PhD in? <laughs> right. Well, why, thank you. I'm so glad you know more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. What, so what did you tell them? What, what, what did you tell them when they corrected you about... I just kept saying Neanderthal, and I was like, I just really don't want to get, that's just like, never going to see this person again, but I also really don't want to have to have this conversation. Right. (laughs) Okay, so how did the health of humans and Neanderthals differ, um, kind of going into like your research and what you found? Yeah, so I mean, I kind of set up the importance of my work based on this idea of like why we as a species are here and there's no other species on the planet. Because if we look at the history of our lineage, there's been multiple species of hominin on the planet at any one time. It's actually kind of unusual right now that we only have one species. Mm -hmm. So why are we so successful? And so looking at oral health differences, like for periodontal disease, Neanderthals have more periodontal disease Mm -hmm. than early modern humans. Um, They have actually more tooth loss, at least in the early modern humans that directly uh, succeed them, come later, Mm -hmm. Uh, then tooth loss starts to go back up again after the last glacial maximum. But if we're just comparing, you know, Neanderthals to the modern humans that first enter Europe, they have less tooth loss, Mm. they have less periodontal disease. And periodontal disease is actually associated with a number of negative birth outcomes. Like in the United States, um, uh, Medicaid still covers dental care up to the age of 21. And so gynecologists will tell you if they have a girl come in on Medicaid who's under 21, the first thing they say is, like, go to a dentist. Mm. Because periodontal disease associated with preterm labor, low birth weight, and spontaneous abortion, a miscarriage. Mm. And so if Neanderthals are having worse oral health, I mean, that could have had impacts on, on their reproductive fitness. Right, right. Which would certainly have been important when we think mm-hmm. about, like, you know, in an ecological sense, them competing with one another. Right, they're not here anymore. Right, why, why? and so it doesn't have to be that modern humans were killing Neanderthals, mm-hmm. you know, or had better technology even. But if they come in and there's more of them and they're reproducing faster and they're healthier, because mm-hmm. if we look at like death profiles, they're not actually really living any longer. But if they're healthier while they're alive, you know, that may result in you know one extra birth mm-hmm. in the lifetime of an individual, and over you know over many thousands of years, that would really add up. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, huh, what what are sort of your um, opinions of like the fad diets that have come out, like the Atkins diet or the uh, the paleo diet, especially? 
I have a lot of opinions. I feel like every time I'm like in, because I'm very chatty in the line at Whole Foods, uh, people are always like, oh my God, I'm on paleo diet. And I'm always like, no, it's a terrible idea. Um, Because how paleo diet is being marketed to you is not the diet of the Paleolithic ancestors for a number of reasons. Uh, I mean, if we look at like eating of grain, right? We see grindstones 30,000 years ago. Yeah. They're eating wild grains. But fish, we don't see systematic exploitation of fish resources until 14,000 years ago. But paleo diet will tell you, eat all the fish you want, don't eat grain. Right? <laughs> and you think about the fruits and vegetables that are available when you go in a grocery store. Those are nothing like the fruits and vegetables that would actually be in the wild, right? right? right. And apples supposed to be tiny and yeah. really bitter. Right? So when you go and buy fruits and vegetables at the store, they're, they've been bred to be full of sugar and really f- big and fat and mm-hmm. like full of water and they're not like anything, you know, very low in like tannins and all these things that make them taste bitter. So they're really not in any way like what a Paleolithic ancestor would eat. Right. Even the meat, right? Like beef is so fatty. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Venison's what, two, three, four percent fat? And like really, really lean beef is nine is ninety percent wow. beef, ten percent fat, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's it's it's really nothing like that. So it what I tell people, if, if you really want to eat like a Paleolithic ancestor, yeah. the best way that you could do it is to eat local and eat seasonal. Mm-hmm. Because that's the best thing you could do for the environment, and that's certainly what they're doing, right? They're eating what's immediately available to right. them mm-hmm. and when it's available. They're not storing food. Right. Huh. And you'd have a really nice, diverse diet, less money on gasoline yeah. and all things. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. that's true. And I just think people... It, it almost gets almost simplified to just, oh, just stay away from processed foods, which I guess people would argue that's the point of like the Paleolithic diet. Um, but I think it's very ironic that our diet's completely different from the way it was back then. So it's... And yeah. like we couldn't think of how much meat it requires to eat the Paleolithic diet. That would be, it would take 10 planet Earths just to sustain all the, all the cows and pigs and everything mm-hmm. to if everyone on the planet was eating as much meat as Americans eat. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. So there's, it, yeah. there's already like a huge amount of privilege in advocating for that kind of diet, right? We're talking about people when they were living at such low population density. There's less than a million people on the planet. Yeah. Right. Now we have 7 billion, right? So it's, I don't think that's it's a fair thing to say like, oh yeah, we can all eat that much meat and it's going to be fine. Like, yeah. no, it's, sustainable. Yeah, yeah, it's not sustainable. Right. Uh, it's cool to look into the past, but how we look into the future mm-hmm. needs to, <laughs> let's really hope that we're not reverting back yeah. to that time period, you right. know, right. Yeah. nuclear apocalypse. And then, <laughs> then go ahead and eat the Paleolithic diet because you don't have any other options. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. We need to be more like responsive, right? Mm-hmm. Just, yeah. Um, so, Kind of looking at all of your research, what would you say are some of like the biggest uh, maybe accomplishments or the things that you've been most like wow about in your research? I feel like we've talked about them. I mean, I was super excited uh, when I found like from Zafariah, which is the oldest Neanderthal, or like the oldest, the most recent Neanderthal, like the last basic Neanderthal before they went extinct, right? Twenty seven thousand mm-hmm. years ago. It's, right. and, Spain and it's missing a tooth and when I x-rayed it there's a giant lesion where the tooth had been so the tooth had fallen out and people just assumed oh it had been lost post-mortem end of story and then I x-ray it and it's like oh my gosh there's a giant lesion in there yeah. right he had a big infection mm-hmm. I'm like wow that's so exciting mm-hmm. probably not exciting to anybody else <laughs> but exciting to me uh, so that kind of stuff has always been really exciting uh, and as far as like kind of research going forward I've been really excited just to like when students get involved in the stuff that I'm doing and find things themselves. Because I, I took all these x-rays mm-hmm. with my, re- my work, and so I have this giant collection of, you know, probably the largest collection of oral x-rays um, of Neanderthals and early modern humans, and then I can just set students on them, and then they come back and they find cool stuff, and it's like, yes, <laughs> right? I don't have to, you know, find money to send them to Europe. They can do it in my lab here. Yeah. So I'm sure they would like to go to Europe. <laughs> uh, I'm taking one to Croatia in August, but <laughs> oh, wow. that's awesome. Yeah, it is. Yeah, she should yeah. she should enjoy that. There's lots of Neanderthals in Croatia. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of thinking about um, have the previous people who've done like the Cobway research like were they also anthropologists or biological anthropologists or what were they? I. They've been biological anthropologists and occasionally dentists. Okay. Uh, there is kind of a, a history of bringing in a dentist. Oh, yeah. So like, have a have a look at this, uh, which I think is kind of fun too. Yeah. I would have actually liked to have spent a year in dental school 
uh, the dean at my, my where I got my PhD was really encouraging. Like, let's go send you to dental school for a year because <laughs> he actually used to be the dean of the dental school until the de- dental school had been closed down there. Uh, and that would have been cool, but you know, there's also you know. I've, I need to get out. I need funding. You know? yeah. So I wasn't able to do it. Uh, but I still would really like it. Yeah. And even now when I go to the dentist, I'm like, let me see my x-rays. And I like have these really detailed conversations with them because, you know, they get to see really cool stuff that I don't you know, get to see, like these really extensive lesions. But then I also see stuff that they rarely see mm-hmm. because rarely do people, you know, like live for a long time with these things. You know, wear their teeth down, that their tooth completely loose, not held down with any bone, and it's called this weird wear patterns on it because it was just like moving around inside the soft tissue uh, as they chewed. Mm-hmm. People rarely show up at a dentist like that. It's right. actually been taken care of a lot sooner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're able to have kind of fun conversations typically. Yeah. Um, so, like, thinking about like kind of the personal, like, how do how you think you've been able to bring like your personal strengths into your research? I think because I've, I've mentioned before, like I take very much like a Marxist perspective. Yeah. Um, that's kind of informed my research, where I, I'm interested in racial equality, gender equality, um, disability issues, mm-hmm. and applying those into the Paleolithic. Because a lot of people don't do that. It's like become kind of just recently become more trendy. Mm-hmm. I know I like. Um, did an anonymous review on a chapter for a book coming out about like bioarchaeology of uh, disability. Yeah. So finally applying those issues into the past, right? Because how we construct those things in the past are different. We want to make sure we're not like putting forth this lens of like, mm. oh yeah, he had arthritis. It must have been so terrible for that poor Neanderthal. And it's mm-hmm. like, well, you don't know how he operated in his society and like mm-hmm. how he was viewed by his peers and how he viewed his own different, differently abled status. Um, so bringing that into it has been really important for me and then also just like really fighting to have different perspectives in paleoanthropology so trying to get students in who are not you know white mustachioed old men you know (laughs) because they're gonna they you know students will say things to me all the time where I'm just like oh my god I didn't think about that yeah and so much in academia because Typically in academia, you know, people get a lot of money from their parents for grad school and things like that, that it ends up really skewing towards this upper middle class perspective and bringing in people who don't have that history. They just can sometimes just make connections that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. Mm -hmm. I think we really need to fight for that. And so that's something in my own personal life that I'm passionate about that I've been able to kind of bring into academia. Yeah. I I think it is interesting that you have that like economist background that because it does look like you are bringing in like more of a I guess holistic perspective where you are sort of saying like what were their backgrounds and what kind of lives did they live that informed ultimately their health um, so yeah I think it's really cool yeah, yeah. Um, and should we, I want to talk about the this hot hominin project <laughs> that you got going on <laughs> because I he showed it to me and you know I, I, I briefly went through it and stuff and it's you know, having something like that specifically for anthropology, I think is, is great. I haven't seen anything like it, and yeah, so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about it. What, what made you want to start it? What are your goals for it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I know from a, a certain perspective, right, students kind of like an idea of what a professor looks like, right? Mm-hmm. They've recently done some study with like asking children, to, or they've been doing this over many years, asking students to draw a scientist, and over time, mm-hmm. they're drawing less, you know, a man in a white a lab coat, right? But Still, that's typically a student's idea of like what a professor looks like. On campus, people usually think I'm a student. Right? So right. I kind of I kind of have fun challenging the idea of like what a professor looks like, and so that's kind of what came out of it with students being like, "Oh, you should have like a professor style blog because you always dress so interestingly," and I was like, "Well, it would still need to be like academic in some way," right. and so it kind of came up with this idea of like, "Let's make an Instagram where it's like every day like me and a different fossil, and I'll give you like." you know, actual information about it, but in kind of like a a cheeky way. And so that's how that got off the ground. Um, And it's been really fun just to play around with and like see what kind of responses I get from people. And, you know, since then, like NBC has interviewed me for an upcoming uh, episode about kind of like the life of bones and how bones are used for education in museums or fake bones, right? Because in a lot of cases, we don't use the real thing for educational purposes. Right. So it's been good for outreach, and that was the whole point, was like, when I got the job in LA, I thought like, 
well, yeah, I'm not interested in any like celebrity or like Hollywood kind of thing, but you know, the proximity to that does make it really easy to think about science outreach and right. like how do we make our work more accessible when you know nearly half of Americans don't believe in human evolution, believe, right? Yeah. right? So how do we reach them? And it isn't just by like being on PBS specials. Mm. Right? There's lots of other ways we can do it. And so I thought, well, like, you know, maybe this will fail, maybe it won't, but let's do something fun and like we'll make an Instagram account and like see if people engage. Yeah. Right. I get, I think that's the biggest thing too, where it's like um, you know, so many of us are on social media and I think it is a great way to interact and engage with with others, um, I think more so with students. Uh, do you have engagement with students on there? Yeah, it's like it's the beginning of the semester, for instance. I like wrote it up on the board and I'm like, follow me. Uh-huh. And then like I get like, you know, they'll like take their exams and they'll be like, oh, you just did a post about this one. And I'm like, I did. <laughs> like, right. Do you remember what it said? Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, so certainly like they're, I mean, they're, they're looking at it. I don't know how much... Th- but I do think a lot of people just like it and, like, don't actually read what I wrote. But, you know. Yeah, I think there's, there's, that tends to happen. Yeah. 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 You're not going to win every battle. So. <laughs> right. It's right. kind of an experiment. We'll see if it works. I have lots of other ideas for outreach that I want to kind of play around with. Right. Yeah. Right. And um, any challenges that you've come across in, in this so far? I mean, generally, it's been really well received. I did, like, recently have one where I posted about a East African fossil, um, Nari Katome, where a friend of mine who is an East African archaeologist, I mean, and I used to work in East Africa, kind of commented that he didn't think that people in East Africa would, like, be particularly well receiving of it mm. because there's like mildly sexualizing like it's I call it hot hominid like more of the sexualizing is of myself than of the fossil but it can be kind of cheeky in that way and so he was like I don't think you know he wasn't necessarily like really telling me I'm wrong but he's like let's like talk about it and think about like how people might res- respond to it that way mm. and so I was like oh I want to clarify that like you know I'm aware of these issues that I'm thinking about you know, who my audience is here. And this very much is targeted towards like a Western audience and a young audience mm-hmm. and uh, a not particularly necessarily scientific, scientifically literate audience, right? Where I'm trying to make it like easy to digest. Mm-hmm. And that's who I'm, I'm directing this towards. And people who are not necessarily part of that target audience may interpret it differently. And that doesn't mean that they're wrong. I, like I need to be aware of that. Right. Um, yeah. But that wasn't necessarily who I would, you know, was taking into account. So I was like a little bit self-critical, like, oh yeah, I need to be more aware of that. I was definitely thinking about who I'm targeting this towards and not other communities. And partially, I also work in Europe now. Mm. And so like people in Europe, yes, they view Neanderthals as like part of their cultural heritage, but not in a way where they're like particularly concerned. Whereas in countries that have been under the history of colonial control, they're going to have a different view of like this Western scientists handling these remains right. and how they're interacting with it when they view much more of a um, like potentially emotional uh, ancestral bond with these specimens. Even though from my view, I'm like, oh, we're all equally related to Nari Kotome. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't mean that people in East Africa view it that way. Right. Wow. Yeah. And I did work in East Africa for a little while with National Geographic. Um, that was fun, but I got really into Neanderthals, so yeah. sorry, Homo erectus. <laughs> <laughs> How long ago was that? Uh, I was over there in 2011. Okay, that's pretty cool. Then, yeah. I think National Geographic, somewhat recently, weren't they saying something about how they sort of acknowledged like their past had been a little bit racist in some ways? A little bit? <laughs> 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 what specifically was this about? Um... Gosh, I, I didn't hear about it. I remember reading an article online, Facebook, you know, they have everything. And they were just saying, yeah, I guess, just kind of looking back, they know that a lot of their, like, there's always that social aspect to it, and they kind of acknowledge that it had been a little bit just racist. Like, uh, of their viewpoint, people. right? Because it's very othering. Yeah. And it's like, oh, look at what these crazy people are doing in the jungle, yeah. right? Mm. Let me document them, but it's very much like othering of those people. Right. It's very much rooted in this like mm. Western colonial perspective, almost kind of fetishizing other cultures. So I think they were it's kind of what they were trying to acknowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they've done a lot of good as well, but certainly, I mean, they're going to be representatives of, of the communities they come from. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, going back to like your activism in, in Missouri, especially mm -hmm. considering like you know Ferguson going on when you you know just started. Um, how how have you been able to like do science outreach there? Like, what did it look like in that kind of space versus you know what you're doing out here? Like, kind of contrasting. I didn't do a lot of science outreach there. I, I felt like there there were voices that needed to be empowered to mm -hmm. be heard and not really mine yeah. right so i didn't want to be going in there and being like let me tell you about race you know <laughs> um my job is to be like facilitating and helping there be like attention on other people's voices but it shouldn't be my voice um so there were times where like i would be approached to be interviewed by media sources and i would try to direct, direct to somebody else uh, the one time I did agree to be interviewed on uh, a Russian media source, actually, mm -hmm. uh, was about something I had particular, like uh, an event I had organized and I had been the facilitator for. So I was happy to give that interview, but then it ended up me getting like some pretty aggressive emails from anonymous people threatening mm -hmm. my safety and things like that. Wow. Because, you know, it had been really set up as this like, you know, people of color versus the police and all these white people are like stepping forward and like taking on this mantle of supporting the police state, wow. <laughs> which is somehow because they felt like they made them less racist if they're support. No, I know. I, I'm just pro police. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then harassing a, you know, a young college professor who had said not like there's a lot of controversial things I could have said. And I didn't. I was like, I really moderated myself <laughs> yeah. in this interview <laughs> and still, you know, getting getting harassed. So why, why did they harass you? Like, what was it that they took issue with? I, let's see, I, basically all that I had asked me about was kind of like tactics the police have been taking as protesters. Mm -hmm. And I point out this one thing where police would kind of walk through the crowd and they'd point out which protesters they recognized. And kind of the mm -hmm. implicit assumption was like, if, if shit pops off, like you're the one I'm grabbing basically. Right. Oh, I know who you are, yeah. you know? And so I mentioned that they had done that. And so they had done this article and it was like, they had done the one where they interviewed me already, but then they made this spinoff article about like, oh, you know, University of Missouri St. Louis professor Dr. Sarah Lacey says, and saying, and then I got these emails that were just like, you know, you deserve to be, all sorts of terrible things happen to you, yeah. mm -hmm. um, <laughs> because somehow I'm like, and I didn't really say anything bad about the police. I just yeah. pointed out a tactic that they were using. <laughs> right. I really could have said some things, and yeah. I didn't. <laughs> right. uh, and in that case, though, I'm happy, like, I'm in a position, I'm in a much more privileged position. I'm happy to take that fire to a limited st stance. Mm -hmm. But as far as, like, people being recognized as, like, a leader of a movement, like, not mm -hmm. me. Like, that's not my place. Mm -hmm. I'm here to, like, provide what, you know, facilitating abilities that I have and the skills that I have, but I don't want to be the face of anything. Right. Right. How about, like, what's going on now with, I, I think, after kind of, like, the Starbucks thing where, you know, those two... Uh, African American uh, men were asked to like leave, and I guess you know that whole thing happened where they called the cops on them. It seems like every week there's like more of these cases where uh, people are calling, in particular white people are calling the police on people of color, mostly black people. So, I, what's kind of your take on this now that's it's kind of blown up into this phenomenon where it's just kind of reoccurring. And I think it was happening anyway. Yeah. And it's it, just getting more attention. Exactly. Yeah. Like the lady in Oakland calling the cops on people barbecuing mm -hmm. and feeling so entitled to do so. Yeah. Right? And getting called out on it and just being like, no, I, I have the right to do this. Mm -hmm. Right? And the cops weren't even coming because even they were like, <laughs> this is not worth our time. Right? Barbecue. Yeah. It's uh -huh. like a, a barbecue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so I think those things were already happening and it's just shining a light kind of on the, the mm -hmm. microaggressions that people of color have can just tell you like oh I've always been living with that I've yeah. always been putting up with that um, it's just getting more attention I mean I I wouldn't be able to want to be able to speak and say whether that there's a higher rate of it now than there was in the past mm -hmm. or even maybe just acknowledging it I don't know if that makes it more reassuring for people or more stressful for people right. uh, I am glad though that it's like that it is getting that attention mm -hmm. but I do feel like you there's a very large community with just going like whoa, whoa. yeah about it mm -hmm. and it's difficult to reach them that's another place and i see it as a white woman it's like mm -hmm. i i have work to do within a white community right yes. i'm recognized as having um, authority because i have a phd and i'm a doctor to be able mm -hmm. to speak to these things and though i'm trying to lift up students of color i also need to be talking to white people 
right? That, mm. that we can't put that entire onus responsibility on people of color to convince white people of their humanity. Right. Wow. Especially, I guess, what, this week, some point Trump said, like, oh, those animals talking about, like, um, well, immigrants, I guess. So that's the whole thing, like, with dehumanizing. Right. Like, oh. That's kind of been the language of the administration, too. So Absolutely. People are following, following suit, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and the thing with that, right, is that we're, we're being inundated with that so often, right? These people mm-hmm. in positions of power saying these things that we kind of start to tune it out. And I'm guilty of it. Like, part of, like, I was much more plugged in in Missouri, partially because my entire social network was around activism. And then now living here where I was new and I didn't know anybody, just trying to make friends. I haven't really, like, found a space within that. And I was kind of burnt out. And it's like it's been easy to be like, oh, just like un, you know, another racist incident, mm-hmm. another thing said. Mm-hmm. And I also recognize that I have I have the privilege to even tune it out, mm-hmm. right? To be like, oh, I'm exhausted of this. And so there's a bit of guilt <laughs> since I've lived here that I haven't. I mean, involved in some things, right? Um, right? Organizing some stuff on campus. I'm on the committee to diversify the faculty. Mm-hmm. Uh, organize a Latinx health disparity conference. That's cool. Um, trying to get involved in housing equity issues in Long Beach. Uh, but also, you know, wanting to make sure I get tenure. Yeah. Right? <laughs> At a certain point, i got all these things going on, and I still need to, like, publish my research and right. Yeah, right. keep my job. Juggling. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned a committee to diversify the faculty. Mm-hmm. So what is – can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, this campus, you know, is – there's a lot of problems with universities, but at least this one is really trying, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so they got some money from the, the CSU, uh, a little pot of money to kind of look at how we do hiring of faculty and try to hire, incentivize hiring more diverse faculty members. Mm-hmm. I don't like the way it was set up because it was only, the money was only over one year and over a calendar year, not an academic year. So it catches the end of one hiring cycle and the beginning of the next hiring cycle. Mm-hmm. And so it makes it really difficult to kind of follow through on a plan for Mm -hmm. hiring more diverse faculty. So there's some issues with it. But at least it's nice that even that money has been allocated to do so. Because you kind of hear this lie a lot in academia from universities of, well, we can't hire faculty of color because they they are so sought after. We We don't even have the funds to get them. And then you look at the data, and faculty of color are still making considerably less than white faculty. Mm. So doesn't hold water yeah because I was on a similar task force at University of Missouri where I was previously because they had had a number of racist incidents and so we had a task force to address diversity issues in general and the big one I was pushing was we need to hire more faculty of color all my students say our faculty don't look like us Mm. and they and they allocated us thirty thousand dollars to do Mm -hmm. that thirty thousand well that was actually to uh, address all of the suggestions we came up with Mm. It's like, well, that $30,000, that's not even like we start up to yeah. hire one person. Right. Like, what yeah. how, What kind of lip service is it to this? There's here, at least we got a lot more money than that. But, you know, I, I don't see how over one year we're going to be able to implement some plan that's going to sh- show 10 years down the line mm-hmm. that we have more diverse faculty. Right. Um, but it is something I'm definitely going to be fighting for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's pretty cool. Um Especially because, yeah, like kind of like you said, there's kind of the, the templates, even in anthropology, maybe especially in anthropology of kind of like, you know, the white male professor. And, um, you know, I, I did come here to Dominguez Anthropology and I don't know, it, it's still, you know, that's kind of what you're going to see. I'm just thankful, at least having been a student, to have faculty who were you know, kind of attentive to having such a diverse student body. Right. Like, but yeah, there's always kind of that work that needs to be done. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I was surprised when I was hired because I was like, oh, you are going to hire another white person? <laughs> uh, but when I talked to students, their feedback was, well, we interviewed other faculty members and you were the one that was actually doing the most mm. around diversity issues. Yeah. And that's why like, the student body weighed in on hiring me as opposed to other faculty members. Um, so it's hard to weigh, right? I mean, right. there's there's the work that you do, but we all are like carrying a lot of privilege. So, mm. you know, I still have a little bit, a little bit of guilt about it. Like, oh, uh. no, you hired another white woman, you know. <laughs> but 
hopefully we'll be hiring someone else in the next like two year cycle and yeah. mm-hmm. uh, we can really try to make sure that the way we write the job listing and everything really encourages a more diverse faculty pool yeah very cool it is um, so what would you say kind of just overall what are you most excited about in your life right now <laughs> in my life does it have to be academic <laughs> it doesn't have to be academic <laughs> uh, yeah I'm like just really excited to be in a new place mm-hmm. this has been really really fun for me this is, I've been in LA now for 10 months and mm-hmm. um, it could have been really scary moving to a new city and a new job and I didn't know a soul and like mm-hmm. I, I feel like I really hit the ground running and I've just like met really fun people and the science outreach stuff is like starting to work, mm-hmm. you know, and like, yeah. okay, that's really exciting. And like students are really excited. Like they're not doing as well as I would like in some of their classes. <laughs> that's a whole nother conversation, <laughs> but they're really like excited to just have someone show up in the classroom and have any sort of passion. Right. So I'm building really fun relationships with students. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, yeah, LA is a pretty fun town. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to go to like a lot of concerts and museums yeah. and just, yeah, I just feel like I have like this very well-rounded life. I'm really happy. Yeah, it's awesome. It is. Yeah, good. Good changes. Sounds like. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I mean, I always like to ask like, what are you most grateful for? I guess it kind of overplays into the last question, but yeah. Grateful for. Hmm. I noticed there's like a female speech pattern of like attributing things to luck, which really are your hard work, mm-hmm. right? right? And so, so often I, I fell into this hole a lot when I was thinking about my job. I was like, oh, I'm so lucky that I got a professorship. No, I, I earned it, mm-hmm. but I'm very grateful. Like, because lots of people also deserve things that they don't get, mm-hmm. right? So though I, I worked really hard and it wasn't luck, I'm just so grateful that it actually paid off, yeah. that I was able to like, you know, I wanted to be a professor and I actually got to be a professor. Because a lot of people, that doesn't work out that way. Yeah. Right. And I do feel like there were times where I was in the right place at the right time, like with the National Geographic thing. Mm. I, I was really just right place, right time. But also, you know, having the the skills to be able to seize the opportunity while it was there. I also could have just squandered it. Right. Yep. So, yeah, I've been, I feel like I've been, yeah, I'm very grateful for like just being in the right place at the right time and getting a lot of really great opportunities because they're, really coming to fruition yeah yeah awesome it is well um thank you so much for (coughs) being willing to speak with us and i think and i hope that it's been very you know informative because on our channel what we've noticed that you know a lot of them tend to be students and um you know the ones who comment as well students and so i think and i hope that this is going to be really beneficial for people who do want to know more and would probably be interested in biological anthropology. Right. Yeah. 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 And also show them that you can be a professor and, like, you don't have to wear a suit. (laughs) You can, like, be really weird. You can dress how you want. You can still go to concerts at night. You you can, like, you can have, like, a really fun social life. But those things aren't mutually exclusive. It's also a big thing here, what I feel like, why students are so engaged with me. Right. It's like, yeah, no, there's not, like... You don't have to be this certain prescription of what a professor is. Mm. You still can be, it's not one or the other. Right. Yeah. Right. It is. Yeah, so they, they know that they can find you on Hominin. Yeah. Is there anywhere else they can find you at? Any websites? Uh, yeah, the website, www.sarahlaceyphd.com. It has like links to research posters I've done in my publications and any sort of like media things that I've been interviewed in. And then, like, I don't know, pictures of me gallivanting around the world. Awesome. (laughs) Perfect. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, (laughs) thank you so much. Three, two, one. Oh, what a minute. (laughs) And we'll add in, like, the the little words at. Yeah, yeah, we'll put put that in. For sure. You pronounce it correctly because you will want to put that D on the end. <laughs> a hominid that includes chimps and gorillas. So oh. Hominid is just our lineage. Got it. I didn't know that. Oh, I should have. I should have clarified that. Yeah. Shit. It's okay. <laughs> we'll, 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 we can still put it in. It's still rolling. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs>